Hello? Hi, all. Uh, welcome to the next session of uh, MBA software testing. This is the unit 3 series. The lecture 5 in unit 3 is about uh, static analysis, code review, and metrics. And today, we will uh, study more on the metrics. Also, we will try to recap uh, what we have studied in the last class. So we go on through the coding rules. Uh, this is one of the important static analysis uh, aspects. So there are uh, ten golden rules suggested by Michael uh, McDougall. So those need to be applied, reviewed, and analyzed against the embedded software code. And it is also important to know what we should be reviewing it at what stage. So all this will be as per the plan against what we need to review there are guidelines and rules and uh, those rules are all against each of these uh, artifacts in the embedded software life cycle so requirements functional specifications rule specifications have their own guidelines and rules and uh, checklists also will be different and these life cycles will have a transition criteria as i said in earlier class in terms of entry exit so the transition criteria needs to be satisfied in order to Say that product is ready for going for the next life cycle output. So we have a how to how much to review also is one of the important factor. So there are different reviewing body like peer level, self review, offline inspection. Likewise, there are many types of review which we use will have its own guidelines and rules that is again subjective depending on the complexity of the embedded software system. So that will decide how much we need to review. The next one we studied about is the program inspections, walkthroughs and reviews. So basically there will be a team involved while doing the program inspection. They will offhand will be given a a set of documents to read and visually inspect before the meeting and the participants will gather in the meeting. The participants can be geographically anywhere that is what we see in the industry. So basically they meet each other then the objective of the meeting is to find errors but they do not have to bother about solutioning of the errors that is how to debug, how to fix that and all that is not part of this review, so it just identifies the errors. So in a walkthrough typically a group of developers with 3 or 4 being an optimal number will perform the review again subjective depending on the complexity. So one participant in this will be an author, so the others will review again artifacts and the will have a conclusion on the error in consent with the author of the program. So there is a uh, group code reading that means the entire code set will be divided into a group and that group they will go through the code and they will discuss about the code issues and the inspections whatever they have done in terms of procedures and all that so they will fill up a checklist the checklist is also called as a tool so what checklist will have is a inspection references in terms of declarations comparisons control flow the data flow the input output for the program interfaces all these need to be checked basically that is what they do and when they do the inspection there will be typically 4 to 5 people one of them will be called as a moderator, so he is primarily responsible for all this activity and he, he also has to ensure the errors that are being corrected against what is being found as a inspection meeting. Peer reviews is something like review method where the equal programmers or testers involved for the evaluation that means a group of people are at the same level in terms of a development or testing 
against each other artifacts they will do a review and of course here also checklists and guidelines are uh, same as that is used in the other review methods any improvement uh, also can be suggested on the updates optimization etc by the peers so that will be taken care as a bug fix along with improvement so it also gives an insight into the approach and the methods at a higher level while on the of peer reviewer so the types of peer review process what we have studied is offline peer review walk through peer review inspection peer pre review so basically the objective of all these will be to evaluate the deliverables work products to verify its completeness compliance and to find defects scope is to conduct the uh, offline review of the different products which say example i have put it could be any of the uh, embedded software life cycle products such as contract documents it could be a project management plan document or a test artifacts etc and deliverables as part of the offline peer review is uh, low level design test cases test plans anything that is comprising for this offline peer review and uh, there is a four important uh, process aspects entry criteria inputs outputs and exit criteria each has its own uh, transition mechanism in terms of deliverables or the outputs so next type of peer review is walk through the objective scope entry input output exit criteria basically remains same but that needs to be identified for this so next one is inspection peer review where uh, uh, as i said in the earlier slide a group of people will uh, gather uh, they go through the artifacts in terms of the programs uh, code uh, the srs hld ld all together and uh, try to come up with the errors that are there in the existing program also suggest to improve in terms of efficiency of the program so this also has entry input outputs and exit criteria okay so that uh, with that uh, we move to the next one uh, test matrix basically test matrix is not just based on the lines of code it is basically based on the complexity and the um, tests how it is going to be conducted and how it is going to be reported basically customer how is going to be satisfied all these aspects need to be collated and identified in terms of its importance uh, to drive what is the matrix that is good for a particular embedded system program okay so we will move to the next session with that background so i will start with the test matrix see here the objective is the process defines the matrix and analyzes analysis process for our projects support services lines of business line of business organization uh, basically this defines the process this process also defines process performance model for statistical management of processes objectives of this process are establish organizations metrics objectives aligned with the business objectives and apply them to the line of business process projects and support functions level specifying the metrics data collection and storage mechanism so basically it is to define the or establish the various metrics that organization needs for that particular embedded project or the embedded project that is falling within the lob lob is something like a line of business typically that is being called in the embedded industry it could be aerospace it could be automotive or it could be a subsystems part of the uh, the main domain so conduct a statistical analysis of data that sub process projects support functions lob and organization levels so here uh, sub process are something like which are derived process from the main process projects you know entire project and support functions something like uh, we have a project and the project needs support functions in terms of uh, administrative or resources resource skills 
HR could be involved, anything, all these matters in terms of dependencies or criticality. For a successful testing program, testing project, I would say the embedded software project also has a life cycle of testing project. So, that is, is very important to have all these organizational aspects in terms of sub processors, projects, support functions, LOB, and organizational levels where. Who is going to make some key decisions to support the smooth functioning of the testing? So, all this will be artifacted in the test matrix. So, that is one of the objective. Then, the next one is establish and maintain a quantitative understanding of the performance of the organizational process and to provide the process performance data, baselines, and models. Establish Feedback mechanisms and provide reports to relevant stakeholders. That means, for each of the process that we have established, there should be a good feedback mechanism that will help in terms of correcting any issues that itself can have that means we have a review process and review process itself has some issues or some corrections are required. So, for that how we are going to evaluate is based on the feedback that means the feedback will bring out some of the improvements in the particular case and the particular process that is being followed. So, that will be reported to the, to the relevant stakeholders such as a test manager or project manager or test lead or is the main stakeholder. So, the last objective is to provide data for process improvement. So, it is not only enough to have or just identifying the uh, these mechanisms in terms of uh, matrix, it is also important to have uh, some sort of a data which can help improving the project process. So, that is also one of the important test matrix. Okay, so test matrix again. I will go to this slide. It's very important. Uh, quantification. So quantification of the data is nothing but the the matrix. But the matrix is not just the lines of code. Of course, lines of code is also one of the matrix. Here, the lines of code is size. So software size is not based on the lines of code, but size should be subjective. Based on the complexity structure of the program that is being used. So, basically, attention is focused on control flow and data flow complexity. Structural metrics are based on the properties of flow graph models of the program. It is very important to have the complexity of the embedded system program and embedded system testing aspects. So, with the help of that. The size or the actual matrix that is going to be evaluated and reported will be done. So, test matrix importance we know that it is very important to have a matrix reported to customer and how much bugs have been fixed, how many are passed, how many are failed, how those fails are addressed, how they are going to be justified, how they are fixed in different phases. So, what is the action taken and what is the trend? The trend we will see in the next slide today. So, basically, the trend will give a clear picture of where the testing is going ahead. So, that is what it gives a picture of the program. So, very important to have a defect matrix trend as a monitoring of the aspect of the test matrix. Also, it provides matrix will provide improvement for the current process in terms of how much we can optimize, how much we can improve, etc. Okay, the next one being uh, 
test matrix life cycle. So test matrix itself has a life cycle. It again depends on the particular project. So this has been defined in one of the ISN journal. I have put the reference in the bottom. So what it says is there are four test matrix life cycle aspects that will be delivered or that will be used. So analysis, communic, evaluating and reporting. Okay. Test matrix life cycle analysis has identified the matrix what is going to be used, define the matrix identified, define the parameters for identifying the matrix which are identified. So these are basically the first phase of the test matrix life cycle that is analysis life cycle analysis phase. So what we do first is identify the matrix to use. So what are the matrix we are going to have just identify those it could be a pass fail count it could be total number of test cases mapping to the requirements it could be a defects fixed with a category like high category low category or defects of criticality defects of minor issues likewise. So those needs to be identified first what I am going to capture then once I identify that metric then I need to define what that metric is going to have suppose pass fail count what is that pass fail count means so you need to have a definition of pass means when the test is being passed when it is verified against certain expected results and the actual results in the expected results are matching it is defined as pass and those pass metrics are identified and similarly fail matrix also can be identified so we need to define them. The next one being define parameters for identifying the matrix identified that means the various parameters that are used for identifying in terms of the inputs or the transition criteria that is being followed. The next phase of the life cycle test matrix life cycle is the communic here what we do is explain the need of metric to stakeholder and testing team basically who are going to <coughs> develop this test matrix who are going to deliver this test matrix who are going to use it so basically the testing team and the relevant stakeholders surrounding the testing team so those need to be clearly explained about what we have done in the analysis we have collected all the defects we have collected all the techniques information inputs of the testing program and that needs to be communicated that needs to be explained to the relevant stakeholders because they are going to develop it or use it whatever has been defined educate the testing team about the data points need to be captured for processing the matrix so we have defined it we have identified it how are we going to do it so all that how will need to be clearly entered or told to the testing team that is very important so that is what we do in the <coughs> communic life cycle part of the test matrix the next one is the evaluating so what we have done in the communic is we are told and start the activity of the matrix collection the matrix usage and all that so once we have the matrix available that needs to be verified that needs to be uh, reported appropriately I mean report is the next uh, life cycle part of course for reporting before that we need to have a appropriate calculation in terms of percentage percentage uh, calculations it could be trend updates any formula that needs to be used all this have to be done because usually this will be done auto using automated uh, reporting automated way. So how they do usually is using the excel sheet so 
so excel sheet is a very good tool in terms of reporting the artifacts so all this will be part of the capture verify and calculate the metric so verify is also one of the important aspects why because whether it has been captured rightly and correctly without any errors so that is also important aspects basically what we do is we evaluate the captured data and verify against the data has been correctly captured and we do a calculations uh, which will be which will be which will help basically reporting the metrics so we use different tools for doing the capture and uh, calculation the final uh, life cycle phase is the reporting so what we do in reporting is develop the report with effective conclusion that means we need to present it appropriately so that the customer it could be or could be higher managers or it could be a, a program management team so they need to be knowing what is going to happen what is going on and what is the defects how it has been captured how they have been evaluated all these aspects have to be presented appropriately so we need to develop a very good report in terms of objective scope description then uh, uh, we should have a uh, uh, evaluating mechanism what are the issues that are found in the testing and how they have been reported all this also we should end the report with a conclusion and a summary saying that this product is fit for use or this product has some issues why those issues are there if those issues have been fixed or justified the product is good to use and the product has this many major issues this many minor issues all this can be correctly reported that's what it means then it is to be once the report is done you need to distribute to the stakeholders and respective representatives so we can also have distributed to development team representative who can take a look into this and try to improve or fix the issues in that particular life cycle also we need to this very important that whatever the report we have developed and reported is rightly understood and rightly being reached to the stakeholders so how do we go to do how we are going to do is by taking the inputs the feedback from the relevant stakeholders so that is what we do with the reporting life cycle okay so software testing metrics types so what are the testing metrics types that we have today for a embedded system project is we know that we are going to have different types of testing so they are all broadly categorized into automated manual white box black box all this static analysis to be review artifacts all this will be part of one of these three what are those uh, manual testing metrics performance testing metrics automation testing metrics so we will study each one what is manual what is performance what is automation so we know that testing can be done manually so like analysis some of the assembly level uh, debug or uh, uh, testing may not be possible to do with the dynamic testing automated and all that so we need to use uh, environment such that the environment is, environment is driven and verified manually so those manual testing matrix also need to be captured also we know that static uh, analysis is also a part of manual testing where we do the uh, testing without executing the program so that will be part of manual testing performance testing uh, performance of the execution execution summary execution data uh, it could be on a client side server side and efficiency all this uh, like uh, timing performance and uh, memory all this will be uh, separately reported using the performance testing matrix the automation testing matrix so what we do is we will 
report the we will capture and report the matrix for the automation uh, how much has been done what are the artifacts what are the failures passes during that automation of the tests. <coughs> Let us try to study uh, the software testing matrix in uh, detail ok. So, manual testing uh, matrix we will have a productivity test case productivity test execution summary defect acceptance defect rejection bad fix defect test execution productivity test efficiency defect severity index. So, these are some of the testing matrix. So, some of the important matrix in this manual we will try to explain in the next slide. So, basically what it does when we go through the testing life cycle where we do a test case development, test procedure development, test script development, test execution, test execution refix, regression testing all these. So, we will definitely will have different types of artifacts accumulated in terms of test cases itself and the program underneath which it is been tested also can be used. So, test case productivity basically how much productive the tester team has in terms of developing test cases and test execution summary that means in terms of execution how it went well in terms of how much time it took for a manual test execution. So, what is what are the results printed all this will be part of the summary. So, that also will be metricized. Then defect acceptance whether the defects 100 defects are reported how many of them are really defects how many of them are rejected defects that also need to be captured. Bad fix detect it means the program has issues and the issues have been fixed, but the fix is not correct. Then the test execution productivity how much productive the test team or the execution it could be a resource or it could be a resource from human whatever it is. So, some tests may take a few hours some tests may take few minutes depends on the complexity and the type of test design that is being done. Then the test efficiency, how efficient the testing is, the manual testing is. Then defect severity index, that means how severe those defect are, the defects are. Coming to the next one, performance uh, testing matrix. We have a performance scripting productivity. We have performance uh, execution summary, performance uh, execution data in terms of uh, host side and server side. You can assume this as. target likewise you can apply it is based in an example that is being taken. Then the testing efficiency of the performance testing then the performance severity index all the performance type of testing will have to be captured separately using the testing matrix guidelines. So, that is what the software testing matrix types we will pick up a couple of good examples of this uh, matrix test case productivity. So, what is a test case productivity or total uh, case productivity? So, the formula is test case or TCP it is called as productivity is nothing but total number of test steps divided by efforts into step hours or into steps or hour. So, that's, that will give total number of uh, sorry the total uh, productivity of the test case development that means uh, there are uh, number of steps say 100 and the effort took for that is few hours that will be divided against that and that will be nothing but the step hour steps per hour that is what is the test case productivity. So, example it is given here. So, test cases x y z 1 2 3 4 5. So, each one has its own number of steps 30, 32, 40, 36, 45 etcetera. The total number of steps are 183 
so for example the effort that is taken for developing these steps is 8 hours so what is going to happen is the test case productivity is going to be 183 divided by 8 what has been spoken here in this formula which is 22 that means the test case productivity is 22 rounded off 23 steps per hour so 23 steps per hour is the productivity so so what way this is going to be useful in what way it is getting used so you need to understand that so there are different aspects that are important why this test case productivity is used productivity is important in terms of improvement estimation and confidence so this is these three aspects are basically the driving factors for identifying the test case productivity so if the test case productivity is good uh, in the next cycle suppose from the previous cycle that means we have improved and if we take a new project or there is a uh, testing project has come with so and so complexity and so and so lines of code and so and so type of testing required so we know we have taken this much to develop the tests and we will apply for estimating that new project that is the factor that we will use it it again depends on the complexity but subjectively it has to be taken care based on this uh, test steps how they are, they are written whether it is similar to that or it is different than what we have done in the earlier project likewise. So this test matrix is very important and the last one being confidence basically it gives a confidence for the program management and the test management by seeing the productivity how much productive the testing team in terms of developing test cases. So that is what the importance of test case productivity. The next type of uh, matrix is DA, defective accept the defect acceptance basically. So we know that uh, the tester will test and report the defects, whether those defects are valid or those defects are invalid. So that also need to be identified from the developers or the tester themselves. So he has written a test steps, he has uh, executed the test steps and it has failed let us say the failure could be there in two ways the failure could be there in the software the failure could be there in the requirement or failure could be there in the design whatever it is on the other side also it is important to know whether the failures are real. the failures are real failures acceptable failures or there is an issue with the invalid uh, test case design or test steps for example suppose we have you know that in test case design we have a expected result column and we have actual result and expected result is spoken as true and actual result has become false so we report this as a failure suppose instead of mentioning true the tester has wrongly mentioned as false what will happen the actual report actual result and expected result will match and we report as non failure so what will happen is it is falsely been reported as a pass but there is a issue so we need to correct that as a non accepted failure so this is very important in terms of defect acceptance so defect acceptance formula is for like this total number of defects we have and how much of them are really valid for example we have 40 valid defects against total number of 
50 into 100 become 80 percent right so that is the percentage that we are going to draw so this will give me 80 percent of defects that have been reported are valid and 20 percent there is a issue 20 percent are invalid defects that is defects are not really genuine or there is an issue with the test case or the reporting whatever it could be or a documentation. So, it is very important to understand the defect acceptance as one of the key metrics that has to be reported. The next one defect rejection this is also one of the important test metrics. Uh, this will determine the number of defects rejected during the execution that means the reported defects are not justifiable or the issues that is found out in the requirement or the design are not accepted by the development team. So, those acceptance to rejection, rejection ratio is nothing but the rejection percentage or DR percentage. So, defect rejection is nothing but number of defects rejected divided by total number of defects into 100 that is the percentage. So, here it is a valid defects, here it is a defects rejected. So, that is what the percentage. The next one is being test execution productivity. This is also very important uh, testing matrix because this will uh, give a uh, good estimation of how much it is going to give, how much time it is going to take for a given product having so and so steps having so much so and so test cases. So, basically this test metric gives the test cases execution productivity which on further analysis can give conclusive result that means we have the test case productivity. in terms of hours basically or days it could be. So, there is a formula here test case or test execution productivity is nothing but total number of test cases executed here by hours total hours it takes into 8. So, 8 is what typically the allocated time in a working hours of the day basically. So, that is what the optimal value they use. So, where T is nothing but T is calculated as test cases. So, number of test cases executed at least once So, number of test T T of one is nothing but T of 1 is said to be number of test cases are retested within with 71 percent to 100 percent of total test case steps T 0 0.66 is equal to number of test case retested with 41 percent of 41 to 70 percent of total test case steps T 0.33 will give a matrix as number of test case retested with 1 percent to 40 percent of total TC steps. Okay. So, basically here idea is we should have executed the test cases at least once it could take multiple uh, iterations that is fine, but uh, typically uh, the productivity is based based on the one time execution. So, that in the regression we do not have to repeat the executions uh, as we did in the primary stage. So, that is what it means. So, retesting aspects will be defined like this T of 1, T of 0.66, T of 
that means that is the percentage 33 percent 66 percent likewise so about 1 to 40 percent of total test case steps will take uh, retesting and 40 to 70 percent of total test cases will take 66 uh, 0.6 as the test case execution productivity and ideally 71 to 100 percent of total test cases will take the productivity as 1. So, that is what it says. So, how productive we are in terms of executing against the hours is what test execution productivity. The next one test efficiency how efficient we are in terms of executing the tests and reporting the effects. This metric define determine the efficiency on the efficiency of the testing team in identifying the defects. It also indicates the defects missed out during testing phase which migrated to the next phase. So, test efficiency is nothing but dt divided by dt plus du into 100 this gives a percentage value. So, where dt is nothing but number of valid defects identified during testing du is nothing but number of valid defects identified by user after release of application in other words post testing defect it means during testing we have number of valid defects and uh, the defects that are identified still after the release of the application is nothing but the the post release defects suppose we have detected from few errors and few defects in the pre release phase of the perfect testing and that has been fixed retested and it is passed all this has closed and we have released still there are issues which are uncovered during the test execution. So, that uncovered portion of that is nothing but the efficiency of the tester and the efficiency of the testing life cycle it shows. So, basically the number of valid defects if it is uh, of course d t is equal to. So, suppose 20 defects have been identified and they are fixed and they are released and uh, there is number of defects found out during the uh, post testing on the field on the user side if it is say suppose 10. So, what will happen is d t plus d u equals 30 and uh, we have dt by dt plus du dt is 20 divided by 30 into 100 basically. So, something like 60 percent whatever it is right. That means, two third of the thing 60 percent of the defects efficiency we have that means, we are efficient 60 percent in terms of testing the product still we have a gap of 40 percent it is not uh, 66 equal to approximately. So, still we have a issue with the uh, testing that means, it is we are not efficient. So, in embedded industry typically they expect 95 percent is what the metrics they follow because nowadays uh, it has to be very stringent and uh, uh, the companies are not afford to reproduce uh, re execute again retest and all that because it is going to add a cost a lot. So, you cannot afford to have any bugs or post release issues we have to be 90 or above percentage in terms of efficiency that is one of the important metrics. The next one is a <coughs> defect severity index. I will tell you overall, so you do not have to bother much about the formula and all. This is basically identifying the severity of the defects, that means we have about 
10 defects so all defects need not be very severe it could be a major issue or minor issue or a trivial issue like this we can have a category severity in terms of how much it is going to cost in terms of damage to the product or it is going to have a impact on the product functionality or the behavior so it could be a major it could be a minor so each one will have a its own weightage basically so that weightage is what will give you the index the defect severity index DSA is also one of the important software testing methods that is there in the industry today. And the formula is like this defect severity index is nothing but the sum of severity index into number of all defects for that particular severity divided by total number of valid defects. So, one can divide the defect severity index into two parts DSI for all status defects, that means how the status have been reported. This value gives the product quality under test. And the next one is the DSI for open status defects. This value gives the product quality at the time of release. That means when we are going to deliver the product, at that time we are going to have the open status defects. So those severity will be reported. For calculation of DSI for such open status defects, so only open status defects must be considered. So the formula is for that DSI is sum of severity index into number of open valid defects for this severity you have a total number of valid defects so that is what a DSI open severity index will indicate. The next one is automation coverage. So, this is also one of the important metrics we have. So, this metrics gives the percentage of manual test cases which are automated. That means we know the testings cannot be done 100 percent automation. So, we need to do a subjective automation and subjective manual testing. So, there is a mix of both. So, how much percentage we can able to automate because automation we do not have a human or uh, human dependency it is done by the machine and we know the productivity and we know the coverage. So, coverage is basically total number of test cases automated there the total number of manual test cases into 100 that will give you the automation coverage. Example if there are 100 manual test cases and one has automated 60 test cases then the coverage is 60 percent. So, that is what the meaning of automation coverage. The next one is effort variance, this is one of the important metrics that usually managers they do. Hello. So, automation coverage we know that how much of the tests test cases have been automated against the manual test cases. The next type of matrix is the effort variance this is one of the important matrix that is been used by the program management or the higher up basically. So, effort variance is the actual effort minus estimated effort divided by estimated efforts and multiplied by the 100 that gives the percentage. So, basically what we do is we know how much time how much effort it took for a particular testing it could be say 200 hours this is what is 
estimated basically that means start of the program we know that 200 hours is much is going to take for a suppose so much of test cases and actual if that has happened is some omity let us say. So, what is the variance how much it is having variance is nothing but actual effort minus estimated effort which will give you minus 20 usually it will be more depending on the type of projects but appropriately it will be done. So, divided by 100 sorry divided by 200 will give you 10 percent basically minus 10 percent. So, similarly if we have taken the actual value as 220 hours suppose in that case how much it will become 220 minus for estimated is 200 this will become 20 divided by 200 that at that time it is 10 percent. So, effort variance that means whatever the variance we have from the estimated efforts is 10 percent in a typical embedded industry the variance accepted is minus 10 to plus 10. So, you may ask question why minus 10 comes to be sometimes what will happen is it will be overestimated because of a lack of knowledge or something. So, but we do not take that much effort. So, to be on the safer side what they will do is they will add some 5 to 10 percent of more estimation then do the um, testing. So, what will happen is over a period that will spill over here and there, but maximum allowed threshold is minus 10 to 10 plus 10 percentage is what the variance that they can offer. So, that is what the effort variance is about. The next step of uh, matrix is schedule variance. So, what do you mean by schedule variance? So, we know here also estimation is there. So, estimation is done in two ways we know that typical estimation I am talking about there are different types in terms of efforts in terms of duration both are very very important in terms of schedule this is all schedule aspects ok. So, efforts variance will talk about efforts and duration variance will talk about schedule variance. So, schedule variance is nothing but the actual number of days minus estimated number of days divided by estimated estimated number of days in terms of percentage suppose for 10 tests or 20 tests the estimated days is nothing but 20 days and actually it took 25 days. So, what is the schedule variance which is also called as SV actual number of days 25 we have to negate that with the estimated days estimated is 20. So, divided by estimated 20 how much will become 25 minus 20 is nothing but 5 5 divided by 20 nothing but 1 fourth or 0.25. Which is nothing but 25 percent. So, we have a variance of 25 percent. So, usually in typical industry, it is not allowed to have too much of a variance, schedule variance. So, better to have a limited or controlled schedule variance. So, that is why it is suggested to have SV and EV calculated regularly. So, that we know how much we are progressing. So, very important aspects of the embedded software testing. So, usually 5 percent is what schedule variance I have seen it, it depends again on the duration and the complexity of the projects etcetera. So, 5 percent is what they allowed here and there, but 
this is very important uh, testing matrix they use across the project throughout the project in uh, between as well as in the beginning and in all the phases so that is what sv and ev effort variance schedule variance I'll repeat effort variance is the variance of the estimated effort schedule variance is the variance of the estimated schedule uh, last one being scope change this is the important matrix also the matrix this this one indicates how stable the scope of testing is that means we know what is our scope so we need to be knowing uh, how much it has changed from the original scope that has been defined and the scope whether it has increased or decreased during the testing or after the testing whatever it is. So how it is calculated is scope change basically that is the matrix we are going to produce scope change is nothing but total scope minus previous scope divided by previous scope into 100 in terms of percentage where total scope is previous scope plus new scope if scope increases total scope is previous scope minus new scope if scope decreases for example scope change so previous scope is suppose 10 that means 10 is my scope here 10 scope means uh, I have 10 requirements to cover and the total scope is 20. So scope change how is going to be calculated? We have total scope minus previous scope 10 divided by previous scope in terms of percentage. How much it is become now? 10 minus 10, 10 divided by 10 equal to 1 percentage. 100 percent right all right yes 1 into 100 so 100 percent of the scope got changed that means doubled something like that so scope is increased right because the previous scope was 10 and uh, total scope at the end of testing or due testing uh, it has changed it has increased 100 percent if a scope is going to decrease then it will be uh, decremented the uh, scope calculation previous scope minus new scope is nothing but scope decreases that is what the total scope this originally I start with 100 requirements as a scope to cover in the testing and during that period of testing that has changed the scope of the testing so the change could be added a new scope requirements or are added new test cases or decreased or decremented test cases or scope. So the scope decreases or the scope increases. So that is what the scope change. This is one of the important test matrix they use across. Okay, so that is what the software testing matrix is about. So in the next session we will try to conclude about the automation test matrix and how we are going to manage, how we are going to report it, so what are the trends, burn down charts, etc. And with that we will try to complete the unit 3 session in the unit 3 session in the next lecture.